In the first part of this training package, we considered how the world's weather systems are generated and how they can affect ships at sea. In this part, we shall look at the hazards associated with different types of sea condition and show the importance of onboard weather observation. Incidents due to weather cost the industry huge sums each year. By navigating around storms, or slowing down if caught in one, you will almost certainly save money as well as be safer. Your ship may travel further, but should arrive sooner. It is the responsibility of the ship's master to review all the information which is available and make a balanced judgment with regard to the safe passage of the ship. Much of that information will be gathered at first hand. Observing the weather is an important part of the watchkeeper's routine. An experienced observer will be able to estimate wind force from the appearance of the sea using the Beaufort scale. This is described in more detail in the accompanying booklet. Wind direction should also be gauged. It is approximately perpendicular to the tops of the sea waves, or can be computed from the output of an anemometer, having taken out the component due to the ship's own movement. The watchkeeper should also make an estimation of wave height, direction and speed, and the direction of swell all these observations being entered into the ship's log. Probably the most important measurement is that of atmospheric pressure. In particular, a rapidly falling barometer indicates a deep depression or storm is approaching. It is the trend in pressure over time which is most important. The air temperature should be noted, as should the relative humidity, which is derived from the hygrometer. This device relies on the rate of evaporation from the bulb of a thermometer that is wrapped in a single layer of material dipped in distilled water. The hygrometer depends on the free flow of atmospheric air, so its container must be positioned properly, well away from vents, skylights and the funnel. Relative humidity has a bearing on whether or when cargo should be ventilated. If done when conditions are wrong, cargo or ship sweat might occur. As a result, perishable goods could deteriorate or metal cargoes start to corrode. The sea surface temperature is another important reading, particularly as it can help warn of advection fog, the presence of ice, or even a tropical revolving storm. The traditional method of lowering a bucket into the sea for a few minutes and measuring that temperature is still the most reliable. Many vessels can take a reading from the cooling water intake in the engine room, but because the engine room itself may be very warm, this reading could be false. Clouds are categorized by their appearance and altitude. At the highest level, from about 5,500 up to 14,000 meters, lie cirrus, cirrocumulus, and cirrostratus clouds. If cirrus clouds, high thread-like streaks, grow in extent and move quickly across the sky, they could indicate the approach of a depression or a tropical storm. At the mid-level, from about 2,000 to 5,500 meters, lie alto cumulus and alto stratus clouds. Alto stratus, thin and featureless, only partly obscures the sun or the moon and indicates the approach of a depression and continuous rain if it is seen to thicken to windward. Near the surface could be clouds which are confined to the lower level or which tower up to huge heights. Stratus, nimbostratus, and stratocumulus reach only to about 2,000 meters. Stratus, at the surface level, is the same as fog. The nimbostratus, or rain cloud, is grey, formless, 
and thick enough to obscure the sun. It is frequently associated with the passage of a front and the onset of bad weather. Cumulus and cumulonimbus clouds reach right up from the lower level to about 14,000 meters. Cumulus are white and fluffy with hard-edged tops showing clearly against the blue sky. The cumulonimbus, or thunder cloud, is a large round cloud with a flattish base. If it is threateningly dark in appearance and the top spreads out somewhat like an anvil, it is a reliable sign of a coming thunderstorm, accompanied by sudden vicious squalls and heavy rain, hail or snow. Reference books will help the watchkeeper make a positive identification and learn to associate the different types of clouds with particular weather patterns. By themselves, clouds are not generally a good predictor of imminent changes in the weather, but taken with other signs, they can confirm a forecast's predictions. For instance, the passage of a warm front may be characterized by cirrus cloud being replaced by cirrostratus, then altostratus, followed by nimbostratus, with increasing rain. The passage of a cold front is often marked by stratus or stratocumulus cloud, giving way to cumulonimbus or cumulus with heavy rain. Some ships carry out detailed observations on behalf of the various meteorological bureau. Great accuracy is required and special instruments like the precision aneroid barometer, will be supplied for the purpose. The pressure measured, like all other recorded measurements, is converted to a code for efficient transmission of the entire report. Pressure is also recorded by the barograph, which traces the reading on a paper roll and displays the trend. For a precise and standardized reading, a correction table is supplied, which allows for the height of the barometer above sea level, a figure which varies according to the ship's loading. The collected information, now in numerical code, is transmitted by telex. Onboard measurement of weather data is becoming increasingly automated. The data may also be sent off by computer at preset times. Nevertheless, observing the weather at first hand and comparing this with weather reports will help build up an understanding of how the weather changes. Weather reports are received by fax, satellite or radio. Typically, a synoptic map is printed out. This shows isobars, the shape of which indicate a depression, an anticyclone, or the many states in between, the warm and cold fronts, and the wind direction and strength. The facts may also reproduce satellite imagery, particularly useful in areas prone to tropical revolving storms. Navtex supplies more localised weather information from nearby shore stations and CSAT, received by Telex, a more wide-ranging description. Even while in port, it is good practice to monitor weather forecasts prior to departure. If the vessel subscribes to a weather routing service, as described in Part 1, a recommended route will be transmitted to the ship and will be updated to incorporate recent changes. Without such a service, the navigating officer should use his own observations and predictions from received forecasts to alter course, to minimize the effects of any heavy weather ahead. In temperate latitudes, a deepening depression causes stormy weather. It will move approximately along the line of the polar front. When the depression has developed, the cold front will move more quickly than, and will probably occlude, the warm front. With a series of synoptic charts, an established depression's future track may be predicted fairly accurately. 
Depending on the nature of the hazards ahead, specific action will be required on board to reduce the chance of damage or losses. Your company will have published procedures and checklists to be followed when entering heavy weather. If the forecast is unfavourable, these should be applied even before leaving port. They would typically include inform the chief officer, the chief engineer and the galley that heavy weather is expected. Check all open decks for security of lashings on lifeboats and life rafts, mooring ropes, etc. Check that vents are closed to the possible ingress of water, that anchors are heaved tight and secured, and that all hatches are properly secured. Isolate power supplies to all deck machinery and windlasses. Check and secure all loose items in the accommodation, especially in the galley and dining area. In the engine room, check that all drums are properly secured and that any lashings securing movable items are tightened. Check that all watertight doors to accommodation and main deck are properly closed. Rig safety lines wherever likely to be required and post warning notices on all doors leading to open deck. Inform all crew that they must report to the chief officer and the bridge before leaving the accommodation. If entering an area of extremely cold weather, many other precautions need to be taken, and these are explained fully in Videotel's training package, The Cold and Heavy Weather File. As the first part of this package made clear, tropical revolving storms can present you with the worst weather you're ever likely to meet, and they should be avoided wherever possible. They arise relatively quickly. You may find you're heading into one before official warnings have been broadcast. So your own observations are vitally important. Radar is limited by its range. To see any characteristic rain pattern, the ship will already be much too close for comfort. If sailing through an area where such storms are possible, the barometer should be checked hourly. In the tropics, the large variations in pressure caused by moving weather systems do not generally apply. But there is a regular daily or diurnal variation of about 3 millibars, caused by the variation in the sun's heating effect. Millibars are also known as hectopascals. On a graph, the variation looks like this. Tables are available which detail the allowance to be made for diurnal pressure variation. The corrected reading should be compared to the one published in the Admiralty Sailing Directions or other similar national publication for the locality and season concerned. If it is more than three millibars lower than the published figure, or if there is a marked departure from the regular diurnal variation, there is a risk of a tropical storm developing. In such circumstances, a warning should be sent by radio to coastal stations and repeated to other ships in the vicinity. If the corrected reading is 5 millibars less than normal, the vessel is probably within 200 nautical miles of a TRS. Note that the correction for diurnal variation should not be entered into the log or included in broadcast weather reports. It is strictly for local use in the tropical cyclone season. Other warning signs which might have a bearing, even before falling pressure is apparent, are the appearance of the sky, high cirrus clouds, particularly if they form a V shape, and vivid sunsets or sunrise that might anticipate a storm up to 600 nautical miles away. A long swell coming from the storm centre and which travels faster than the storm and a noticeable pickup in wind force. A tropical revolving storm can be divided into four sectors, 
the dangerous semicircle, shown in red, with its leading and trailing quadrants, and the navigable semicircle with its leading and trailing quadrants. The dangerous semicircle is on the right-hand side of the storm in the northern hemisphere and on the left-hand side in the southern. This is because, in each case, the general airflow in the adjacent area of subtropical high pressure adds to the strength of the winds in these directions. To minimize the worst effects of such a storm, the master needs to know the bearing and distance of the storm center from the ship and in which semicircle he is sailing. Otherwise, he might take avoiding action which actually leads the ship into more dangerous areas. Generally, the weather services will be providing accurate information about the position of the storm. But if it has arisen suddenly, or if all communications are down, there is a method using careful observation. First, use Bayes Ballot's law. Face the wind, and the centre of the storm is on your right in the northern hemisphere and on your left in the southern hemisphere. But remember that the wind crosses the isobars at about 45 degrees at the edge of the storm area. So when the corrected barometric reading starts to fall, the bearing of the centre will not be directly to the right, but about 45 degrees behind. When the barometer has fallen further, in other words, when the ship is closer to the centre, the allowance to be made is less. Second, the distance to the centre can be roughly gauged as about 200 nautical miles if the corrected reading is down 5 millibars from normal and the wind is at about 4.6. The centre is probably within 100 nautical miles if the wind force is about 8. Third, which quadrant? To a stationary observer, the wind shifts to the right, or veers, in the right-hand semicircle. And shifts to the left, or backs, in the left-hand semicircle as the storm approaches and passes. This applies to storms in either hemisphere. So in the southern hemisphere, the wind also veers in the right-hand semicircle. And backs in the left-hand semicircle. Thus, if the ship is hove to and successive estimates of wind direction are made, the semicircle the ship is in can be established. If the barometer is falling, the ship is in the leading quadrant. If rising, in the trailing quadrant. Once you have established the ship's position in relation to the storm, you should obviously steam to safer waters. Either out of the storm zone, or at least from the dangerous to the navigable semicircle. A modern fast ship might easily find that it is overtaking a storm. In other words, it is sailing into one of the trailing quadrants. If so, the best procedure is to steer away from the center or heave to and wait for the barometer to rise. Whichever quadrant the ship is in, it can expect very heavy seas and should immediately take steps to minimize any damage. As we saw in part one, it is not high winds which present a danger to a ship's progress so much as the waves they generate. One cubic meter of water weighs more than one ton, so a wave of green water crashing down on the foredeck presents a real danger of cargo being lost, structural damage, and the removal of hatch covers. Water entry below decks could ruin the cargo and leave it valueless. Head seas only present a problem if the wavelength is similar to or greater than the ship's length, with the greatest loads being induced when they are equal. 
These problems have been studied using model tests in a tank, where wave height and frequency could be controlled. When the wavelength is equal to the ship length, the shipping of seas is a regular occurrence. Even when the waves come at irregular intervals, as in real conditions, the action of the shipped seas can be quite violent. There is the associated problem of slamming. Having risen up on a crest, the hull slams down onto the next trough. High frequency oscillations may be induced throughout the hull structure, leading to metal fatigue and severe damage to the bottom, the bow, or bow flare. At the other end of the ship, there is another serious problem. As soon as the propeller clears the water, there is a decrease in load, causing a sudden increase in revolutions. This leads to intense vibration and potential damage to the propeller shaft and engine. Many engines have a cutout mechanism to prevent over revving, but this could result in loss of power. The key finding of this research was that only a slight reduction in ship speed was needed for a substantial decrease in all these problems. Tests on accurate models of several ship types proved that in all conditions, reducing speed by just one or two knots decreased the frequency of shipping seas by 50%. Reducing ship speed by 20 to 25% more than halved the frequency of slamming. And of course, reducing ship speed reduces the relative speed of waters sweeping over the deck and lessens the likelihood of excessive vibration and engine overheating. Similarly, altering course to change the angle of meeting the waves reduced the problems substantially. With an angle of encounter of 60 degrees, the ship which had previously suffered from water constantly breaking over the bow now shipped no seas at all and slamming was completely eliminated. With following seas, the problems are as bad, with the distinct chance of capsize. Again, there is real danger when the ratio between ship and wave dimensions reaches certain figures. The solution is to reduce ship speed, so that, in effect, the waves are allowed to pass by the ship without causing any harm. Another dangerous effect with following seas is parametric or synchronous rolling. If the period of the encounter with the wave and the natural period of the ship's roll coincide, in other words, if the ship rolls to starboard as the crest of one wave passes, and rolls to port exactly when the crest of the next wave passes, the rolling action is intensified. This can readily lead to the possibility of the cargo shifting, containers being lost, or the vessel capsizing. Again, the ship should be slowed so that the waves pass by at an increased rate. Possibly the worst danger encountered in following seas is the possibility of broaching to. Broaching to occurs once the ship enters the surf riding condition, when it accelerates down the downslope of a wave and loses steerage. Great rotational momentum exposes her broadside to beam seas, and there can be instantaneous capsize. When surf riding, propeller revolutions no longer have a bearing on the ship's forward speed. The researchers identified the surf riding zone, again dependent on ship speed and angle of encounter, and again the safest course of action is to reduce speed. Thus, with both head seas and following seas, the best way to lessen their dangers is to reduce ship speed. Of course, the best solution is to avoid heavy weather wherever possible, and a recent development has been the installation of computer-based heavy weather avoidance systems. 
These may be particularly beneficial on container ships, where the high stacking can limit visibility of the bow area and could delay the crew's awareness of the forces acting on the ship. These systems warn of potential impact damage and can warn of danger even when the weather looks fine. The input data includes the vessel's speed and direction, wind speed and direction, and wave direction, period and height, as observed by the watchkeeper or predicted by a forecast. The system computes the highest likely wave the storm will generate, in this case 14 metres. It also assesses the forces which will impact on the bow, largest for head seas, and the encounter wave period. These calculations can be remade for different ship speeds, warning, for instance, if the ship is likely to roll excessively or enter the surf riding condition with the danger of broaching too. Another display, which changes in real time, defines dangerous areas in terms of the ship's speed and heading. The computer calculates longitudinal wind forces which slow the ship and transverse wind forces which cause it to heel. It senses the pitching motion of the ship through a vertical accelerometer in the bow and strain gauges amidships. This is how the ship behaved on meeting a freak wave, a sudden upward acceleration followed by a shuddering downward acceleration. Alarms are built in to tell the bridge of the likely ingress of water or other structural damage. Areas of frequent fog are well documented, particularly in the Admiralty Ocean Routing Charts and other similar publications. The most common type, advection fog, is caused by relatively warm air flowing over cold sea. Knowing that the sea surface temperature usually has a diurnal variation of half a degree or less, there is a reasonable chance of predicting fog by measuring the air temperature and relative humidity and knowing the dew point and wind direction. If relatively saturated warm air is flowing over a cold sea surface, you can calculate when it is likely to reach its dew point and form fog. Once you encounter fog, there are two very important courses of action. Firstly, the ship must proceed at a safe speed, which means slowing down. This is not just to reduce the risk of collision, but because, should there be a collision, the amount of damage is proportional to the square of the impact speed. Halve your speed and you could reduce potential damage by three quarters. In legal proceedings arising from damage claims, the courts have always been highly critical of excessive speed. Secondly, sound the proper signals, but be aware that audible signals often distort in fog and the direction they come from is not clear. Of course, a very careful radar watch is essential. Again, the usual extent of pack ice and icebergs is well documented month by month and you must be extra vigilant if ice is likely. In some areas, ice occurs where there is often fog. If the fog is dense, especially at night, the safest course is to stop the ship until it lifts. Radar is not reliable in warning of ice particularly since up to 90% of an iceberg lies beneath the surface. However, there are useful warning signs. A noticeable reduction of sea and swell and a glassy appearance to the surface might predict pack ice. Providing the ship is not in a known cold current, a sea surface temperature of one degree Celsius might warn of an approaching ice edge and visually, ice blink, a characteristic glare near the horizon, indicates ice. In the North Atlantic, the position of bergs is tracked by the US and Canadian authorities. Should a master see a berg not mentioned in these communications, 
he has an obligation to report it. Ice which forms on the ship's superstructure will affect weight distribution, and if it forms very rapidly, poses a threat to stability. The conditions giving rise to this are an air temperature of minus two degrees Celsius or less, the ship in heavy seas, strong to gale force winds, freezing rain or snow. In the last 20 years, weather forecasts have become much more accurate and comprehensive. Even so, hazardous weather still presents a danger to shipping, wherever you sail. The number of weather-related incidents and casualties remains unacceptably high, as do the number of incidents involving pollution. With the trend towards totally enclosed bridges, it becomes even harder for the seafarer to experience changes in the weather at first hand. So you need to understand how forecasts are prepared and how to make best use of the technology on board, including computer-based heavy weather avoidance systems, if fitted. Only then can you help ensure a safe passage for your ship, your fellow seafarers, passengers and cargo.